Next Sunday is Valentine's Day. Uh, so I'm beginning a sermon series on the seven deadly sins. <laughs> so it should, it should be a good, though. I think you'll enjoy it. Let's, uh, let's join in our call to worship this morning. It's based on Ephesians chapter 1, verses 2 through 8. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. All praise to Him who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Even before He made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in His eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. Through the Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and he gave you great pleasure. So let us praise our God with our whole hearts for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear Son. For his rich kindness and grace by which he purchased our freedom with the blood of his Son and forgive our sins. All praise and thanksgiving for his wonderful kindness which he showers upon us along with all wisdom and understanding. Amen. We're going to open our service with a wonderful hymn, O Worship the King. O oh, worship the King, all glorious above. O oh, gratefully sing His power and His love. Our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. O oh, tell of his might, O oh, sing of his grace, Whose robe is the light, whose canopy space, Whose chariots of wrath the deep thunder clouds form, And dark is God's path on the wings of the storm. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light. It streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust and feeble as frail, in thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end, our Maker, Defender, Redeemer, and Friend. Amen. We've come to our time for our children's message this morning, and I'm going to hold her. I can't, I can't hold the rest of you. I'm not allowed to do that. All right. I'm going to get my drink here. All right, here we go. You want to come to Grandpa? Yeah? Hi, dear. All right. She's all set. All right, well, I'm a little thirsty, so I'm going to get a drink before I begin the children's sermon. Is that okay with you guys? Okay. good? All right. There's a problem. My pitcher's empty. How am I going to pour water into my glass if there's nothing in my pitcher? It won't work, will it? you got to have something in the pitcher if you want something in the glass. There's nothing works otherwise. Now, last week in the children's sermon, we talked about how we got to have power in our devices, right, if we want to use them, and we got to have that same recharge in our lives that we find in Christ. Well, here's the thing about it. Whenever you go to a restaurant, at least under normal circumstances, they often bring everybody water, don't they? And a lot of times, they'll, they'll come out with a pitcher and they'll go to fill all those glasses. The, the waiter or waitress has a full pitcher, and they are able to then give water to everyone, right? But what if they walked up to your table with a bunch of glasses and said, here's your water, and let me, let me fill them up for you. There wasn't anything in there. Would you be thinking they were a little nuts? 
They wouldn't have anything to share with you, would they? Nothing at all. And so they would need to somehow fill up the pitcher in order to give everybody the water. Well, the way that we fill up the emptiness inside of us is through Jesus Christ. And so when we're feeling a little empty inside, if we'll go to him in prayer, if we'll read his word or have someone read one of Bible stories to us, if we'll sing songs to him, some of the hymns or some of the great Christian songs that are out, it fills us up. And then, kind of like that waiter or waitress with a full pitcher, we can share that with others. But if there isn't anything inside of us, how can we share Jesus with others? And so we must get ourselves filled up so we can pour it out for others. That's what Jesus did. When Jesus was having a real busy ministry and things were just uh, you know, really, really busy and he became a little empty, he'd go away from, he'd pray, he'd spend time with the Father, and then he'd go back and pour out more ministry, more love of Christ on them. That's what we need to do, is to fill up. And we're doing that this morning, right? But we need that daily in prayer. All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we just thank you so much for the children. We thank you, Lord, for your love for them and for us. We ask, Lord, that you would help each one to be filled up with your love that they would know that you're there for them. Lord, help us when we feel empty to turn to you so that we might be able to share your love with others. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. We come to a time of prayer in our service today. All right, let's pray together. Gracious and loving God, we thank you and praise you for this day. We thank you, Father, that no matter where we are, you are with us. We thank you, Father, though, that you have called us to this place today and to, and to this time of worship. We thank you, Lord, for safety for everyone who came this morning and for safety as they go home. We also pray for Gloria's granddaughters as they travel today. Keep them safe, Father, as they head back to Murray. Lord, help them to, uh, to really be careful as they go uh, because they, they just mean so much, Lord. We just ask your blessing upon them. We pray for traveling mercies for anyone who will be traveling, Lord, that you just might keep them safe. And Lord, that in the midst of it all, they might experience your love and your grace. Father, we do lift up Bob and his family at the loss of his wife. We just ask, Lord, that you would strengthen them, care for them, Lord. Wrap them in the arms of your love that they might know that you are there. And Lord, bring your healing touch. Father, we, we pray for little Addison. We thank you, Lord, that she was born healthy enough. And Lord, she's just so tiny. It's a scary time for parents when children are, are dealing with these kinds of struggles. But Lord, we thank you that she seems strong, and we just ask your continued care. We ask that she will grow quickly and healthily, that Lord, she'll be able to go home with her family very soon. Lord, we thank you for the doctors and the nurses and everyone that is working with this little one. Lord, may you bless them with an extra special blessing today. Lord, uh, we pray for Judy as she's dealing with COVID, especially the, the, you know, the stronger pneumonia. We just pray, Lord, for your healing touch to be upon her. We ask that you be with her, with her husband as well, Father, as he deals with uh, being a, a recipient of, of a donor. Lord, we just pray that you would help him as he deals with COVID, as this is so difficult, even in the healthiest of people. Lord, would you give him strength? Be, be with Judy's mother-in-law as well. Father, protect her from harm and, and just bring healing quickly and for their son as well, Lord. Be with all of them and just bring your healing power. Lord God, um, we lift up my Uncle Gary to you. Lord, just be with him and heal him and strengthen him. Lord, help him to know your presence in all of this. And we just pray, Father, that if there's any more cancer, that it would be removed very quickly, that, Lord, you would just uh, remove every single cell and replace them with good and healthy cells. We pray for this lady who fell at Kroger. Lord, we just ask that uh, she might be well, that, Lord, you might heal her and strengthen her. We just ask that she might know that you are walking with her. We pray for the church. We thank you, Lord, for your presence among us today in this time of worship. And Lord, we thank you that you are with us throughout the world as your people are 
lifting up their hands to you and their voices to the world that many more might come to know you. Be with our bishop, Bishop Beard, our superintendent, Reverend Irvin. Lord, just give them strength and wisdom in the work that they do. Help each of us make decisions that are wise and that are the best for spreading your good news. Lord God, we pray for our nation. We ask that you would give us unity, that you would give us peace, that you would help each of our politicians, our president, our vice president, all those in Congress, and also our state and local leaders. Help each of them to seek you for wisdom. There's a lot of noise coming at them, a lot of different ideas, some very dangerous ones, Lord. And so, Father, we just ask that you'd work in the midst of the political system that we are under. And, Father, that you would just have them to call on your name that they might receive wisdom. Lord God, we do pray for the teams that are involved tonight. We just ask, Father, that you would keep them safe. There would not be any injuries, that they would stay well, Lord. And that, Father, there would not be anything done that would bring dishonor to you. Lord, there's so much more we can lift up to you. But, Father, we know that you are with us each and every moment of the day. And so we are truly thankful, for it's in Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue our worship with He Leadeth Me. He leadeth me, O oh, blessed thought, O oh, words with heavenly comfort fraught. Whate'er I do, where'er I be, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. Sometimes mid scenes of deepest gloom, sometimes where Eden's borrows bloom, by waters still are troubled, see still tis his hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand Lord, I would clasp thy hand in mine, nor ever murmur, nor repine. Content whatever lot I see, still tis my God that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. And when my task on earth is done, when by thy grace the victory's won, in death's cold wave I will not flee, since God through Jordan leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. Amen. Well, today we come to our final sermon in our series called Foundations of the Covenant, and we've been covering some of those foundational texts to understanding the covenant of salvation we have through Jesus Christ. 
If you missed any of them, I encourage you to go back on the videos and uh, watch those and listen to those uh, sermons. Now, last week, we talked about the calling of Abraham and how through his descendants, all the world would be blessed because the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would come from him. Now, through Christ, we are all given second chances, aren't we? And the possibility, then, of eternal salvation through him. And if we will only repent of our sin and believe on his name, we will be saved. Now today we are moving forward in the narrative of salvation by seven generations. Now think about that. Here we were, we're back at at Abraham, even before he was called Abraham, Abram. But now we're moving forward seven generations. What's that tell you? Well, he definitely got the son that he wanted, right? And as time went on, his grandson ended up having a whole mess of kids. A whole bunch of them. In fact, the family, as it grew, ended up 70 people from that little couple that just couldn't seem to have a baby. 70 people. And there came a time of a drought, a terrible famine. And you know the story of Joseph, right? Uh, His brothers didn't like him very much. The children of Israel, they didn't like him very much. And so they sold him off into slavery in Egypt. But God used him to not only save the nation of Egypt, remember, all the world's going to be blessed through Abraham, right? He uses Joseph to save the nation of Egypt and then also to save the 70 family members of his family as they come to receive food and live in the best land in Egypt. They're moving up in the world. They're in Goshen, the best, most fertile land they have. But over time, as would happen with 70 family members, this family grows from 70 to thousands upon thousands. Some estimates even say millions, perhaps 2.2 million people. From two little old people to thousands upon thousands and maybe even millions in a nation at that time of only about four, maybe five million people. And a king comes to the throne that the scripture says, who knew not Joseph. Enough times pass that he doesn't really know about the story of Joseph and why all these children of Israel were there. And he gets worried because they're different, and they're mighty, and perhaps they will want the throne. Perhaps they will want to take over the nation. But he don't want to kick them out right then, because, after all, he has a lot of building projects. And he figures the best way to control them is to put them in bondage of slavery. And so as time goes on, slavery gets harder and harder on them. The bondage is worse. Their taskmasters are beating them. They're having to supply the supplies to build the buildings, even though they're the slaves and he's the king. And when everything seems to be going wrong, when the bottom has fallen out of it all, the king's still worried. Oh, Pharaoh looks out at this great nation of slaves And he ought to be worried because he's having them treated terribly. And he says, we better watch out here or they might rise up an army against us. And so he decides on a plan. Let's just kill all the baby boys. We'll solve that problem. Kill all the baby boys, no army in a few years. We'll wear down their fathers until they're not strong enough to do it and they won't rise up to get us. But if you know the story of Moses, you know that the Egyptian midwives that were there that were to help out in the birth of these children, they feared the one true God. All around them, the people of Egypt were worshiping false gods, and in fact, they worshiped the king as a god. 
but they feared the one true God, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the children of Israel. And so they would not do it. They told a little lie. These women just have babies so fast we can't even catch. And so he ordered the babies destroyed later. But Moses' parents loved their baby. They didn't want their baby to be destroyed. And so you know the story. Every child who's gone to Sunday school at all knows the story of Moses' mother. The baby gets to where you can't keep him quiet. That never happens, right? They're afraid that he's going to be found out. They've been hiding him, and so she creates a basket out of bulrushes. She puts pitch all around it, and she puts it in a river full of alligators because she trusts the Lord. But she verifies. She sends her daughter down there to keep watch over the baby. And as the story goes, you know that eventually he's in the water, and as God would have it, the princess comes and finds the baby. She hears his cry. Remember, he can't keep him quiet. And she knows that he's one of the Hebrew babies. Now, what's she supposed to do according to her dad? Kill the baby. Throw him in the river for being alligator food. But instead, she falls in love with this little baby as God places love in her heart. And Moses grows up in the palace of the king of Egypt as a prince. But yet he fears God because his own mama gets to be his nurse and she teaches him about the one true God. Well, he grows up as babies tend to do and eventually gets himself in a lot of trouble because he sees that his people are being treated really bad and he kills an Egyptian tax taskmaster. And so off to the desert he goes. But God's not finished with him yet. As I've went through all of the Old Testament, as I've looked through the Bible, as I continue to read and study, there seems to be one theme that continues over and over and over again that regardless of what we've done, regardless of who we are, regardless of what we're involved in, God is not finished with us yet. He gives us new opportunities to turn to him. He gives us new opportunities to follow his will and his way. And so he calls out to Moses in that desert and he tells him to go back to Egypt and tell the Pharaoh, probably grew up with that Pharaoh, to let God's people go. And Moses says, great God, on my way. You know the story, it's not what happens. He makes excuses. He argues a little bit. God tries to negotiate. Can I at least get air conditioning? You know? And God says, I've got you a spokesman. Now get your feet going and get back to Egypt. And so he does. Meets up with his family. He tells them what's going on. And they go before the Pharaoh. And he says, God says, let my people go. And he says, not a chance. I'm not losing my free labor. And who are you anyway? You're a murderer. Just get out of my court. And so God sends plagues on the land. Six of them. And still the Pharaoh will not surrender to God. God gives him six chances to surrender. Isn't that good? It's not three strikes and you're out. God doubles that. And he still won't surrender. And so there is one last horrible plague. And that's where I want to focus our time this morning. If you have your Bibles with you today, I hope you do, or an electronic device, I'm going to be looking at Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 14. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Exodus 12, 1 to 14 from the English Standard Version. I hear a few pages turning here. Hear now the word of the Lord. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. 
Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, and a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, you shall make your, lamb, your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations as a statute forever, you shall keep it as a feast. This is the word of the Lord for his people today. Let us rejoice and be thankful for all God has done, is doing, and will do. Amen. Well, as our text opens, we find that God is about to do a new thing, isn't he? Something new is about to happen. We see this in God telling Moses and Aaron that he's doing this new thing. They would look back to this event as an important marker in their history. In fact, it would even change their calendars as a reminder of God's deliverance. They would celebrate this feast every year as a reminder of God's faithfulness and deliverance from bondage and slavery. God lays out every detail of the plan. Did you notice how detailed it was? He told them exactly how much lamb to have. He told them how it had to be cooked, with the head still on, I never like it that way, the, the legs still on, and the innards in it. Doesn't sound good to me. You can't boil it, don't eat it raw, why would you want to eat it raw? Maybe some of them thought that was a good deal. Well, ugh, not me. I don't even like it rare. I mean, let's cook this thing if you're going to bother, right? And I want you to eat it in haste. Now, we spend all our time telling our kids to slow down when they're eating, right? Oh, no. Eat it like it's fast food and you've got an appointment, because you do. And I want you to have your coat on, your shoes on, and I want you to have a staff there ready in your hand. So I guess you're eating with one hand and holding the staff in the other, because when this meal's over, you're going to need to run. Now, here's where it gets disgusting to us, right? Let I me mean, think about this for a minute. They're supposed to take the blood of the lamb they've killed in a bucket or something, get themselves a paintbrush, and put it on both sides of their door and over the top. I'd be thinking, God, am I hearing correctly here? You want me to do what with the blood? Surely not, God. But God had laid out the details for him. This is God's plan of deliverance. It's not Moses and Aaron's plan. It had to be done God's way because Moses and Aaron could not deliver the children of Israel on their own. It'd be like the pizza delivery driver saying to his car, hey, get out to the Wiggs' house with that pizza, will you? Car can't do it alone. The car needs a driver or I don't get my pizza. And then I'm grumpy. <laughs> yeah. 
God's the driver of all this. Moses and Aaron, they're the vehicle. It has to be done God's way. They needed the almighty power of God to change Pharaoh's mind and heart. Up until now, Pharaoh has refused to allow the children of Israel to leave. He has defied God at every turn. Even pain, discomfort, trouble, darkness has not changed his mind. Bloody rivers hasn't changed his mind. The situation is dire, but God is still in control, and Pharaoh has to know it. See, Pharaoh thinks he's God. That's the problem. God's not on the throne of his heart. Pharaoh is on the throne of Pharaoh's heart. As I'm thinking about the events in today's text, it caused me to reflect on some of the difficult moments in my own life. Now, of course, the difficulties in my life are nothing in comparison to the difficulties that the children of Israel suffered under bondage and slavery. Just say that up front. Still, we all go through difficult and painful situations in our lives, don't we? Any of you gotten through life so far without any difficulty? I don't see any hands, and I bet in the living rooms when they watch this, that's not going to happen either. We all have difficulty in our lives, right? Things happen. Some are terribly difficult. Some bring great sorrow to us. Some bring pain to us, physical, emotional, spiritual. We all have our difficulties. Our pain is our pain. We shouldn't minimize anybody's pain because that's what they're dealing with and we don't know how exactly they're feeling even if we think they, that we do. Oh, I know how you're feeling. I've had something like that happen before. Uh, I know you just had your arm amputated, but you know, I had a hangnail and that really bothered me. We tend to do that kind of stuff, don't we? You ever hear people talking about surgeries and they're always trying to one-up another one? Uh, you know, I, I had to have a cardiac cath, one will say. Well, that's nothing, man. They had to split open my ribs and do a four-time bypass on me. Another one says, that's nothing. I had to have a heart transplant. I don't know why we do that. We try to minimize other people's pain by making ours more important. But you know what? When pain comes to our lives, when troubles come, when sorrows happen, when darkness is all around and the situation seems hopeless, God still isn't finished with us. One thing we can know for sure is that no matter how difficult the situation we find ourselves in, God is more than able to make a way for our deliverance. But we have to do it God's way. Oftentimes the problem we got into was because we were trying to do it our own way to begin with instead of God's way. When we live according to God's will and follow his plan, he will make a way for us. Because God's plan and God's timing is always perfect. Now we may think he's slow. God, um, I've had enough. And he's going, you ain't seen nothing yet. But his timing's perfect. His plan is perfect. Yahweh, the one true God, the God of Israel, was bringing judgment on the land of Egypt. Everyone in the land of Egypt, Israelites and Egyptians alike, were guilty of sin and deserved judgment. It wasn't that the Israelites were perfect. It wasn't that they were any better than the Egyptians. Well, maybe some of them were a little better than some of the other ones, right? But every person in the entire land of Egypt had sin and fallen short of the glory of God. And as you know, the wages of sin is death, right? Every person in the land deserved death because they all had committed a capital offense of choosing to disobey God. Every last one of them. But here's the difference. The children of Israel believed God and believed in him even though sometimes they did not live perfectly into his will. The Egyptians, at least most of them, believed in the Pharaoh as God and Ra and several others 
but they didn't believe in the one true God who made heaven and earth. And so they continuously defied him. The only means of avoiding judgment was faith in Yahweh that resulted in obedience to his substitutionary plan. The Israelites had to follow God's directions completely. The key step was that application of the blood on the doorposts. Ooh. But it was not the blood of the animal that saved the Israelites. It wasn't. One commentator writes this. I, I liked it so much, I'm just going to read the quote to you because it's so good. The thing that brought deliverance to the children of Israel was faith in their one true covenant-keeping God and obedience to his command to apply the blood of the substitute, goat or lamb, to the doorpost of their houses. That was it. It was faith in the one true covenant-keeping God that made it possible for them to be saved. It wasn't the blood of the animal. It was God who made it possible but they had to follow his way. And the only distinguishing mark between the Egyptians who were sinners and the Israelites who were sinners was that blood on the doorposts and lintels of their houses that night. Because God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over the house. But anyone who does not have the blood, anyone who's not under the blood, the firstborn of their household all the way down to their animals will die because the wages of sin is death. But there's a substitute. You see, as believers in Jesus Christ, one of the most important doctrines of our faith is this the substitutionary atonement. Now, there's an awful lot of people in churches today who have turned away from that idea because they don't want to believe what the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and that the wages of sin is death. But what's the rest of that verse? But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our sins. Okay, who here has never sinned? Anybody? Well, maybe, Elizabeth. Give her time. Because all of sin have fallen short of the glory of God because we all have the stain of original sin in our lives. Remember when we talked about that? And we are in need of of the substitute so that we don't have to die eternally for our sin. Yes, our bodies will die unless the trumpet blast comes before we breathe our last. But if we will allow the blood of Jesus Christ to wash our sins away, then when God looks at us, he sees the blood through which we have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. That's the good news. That's the good news. The substitutionary atonement of Christ is what saves us, not we ourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And it was the blood of the Lamb that saved the children of the children of Israel that night. You see, our God is a deliverer. He delivered the children of Israel from the cruelty of an evil king. Our God delivered the children of Israel from the bondage of captivity. God delivered them from the poverty of slavery. But this deliverance would require obedience on the behalf of Moses and Aaron and all the children of Israel, and it would require that the Pharaoh finally surrendered to the will of God. Our God is still in the deliverance business today. He has a plan for our deliverance from the bondage of sin in our lives. It's a substitutionary plan. And it's through Jesus. 
But if God looks at us and we are not under the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, then we are still dead in our sins and trespasses. And we will have an eternal death in hell. Well, the children of Israel followed God's instructions to their furthest extent, and they made ready to leave for the promised land. God had promised deliverance, and they believed that their covenant-keeping God would indeed keep his promises. And before the sun would arise the next morning, the awful consequences of Pharaoh's refusal to surrender to God's will was evident. Exodus 12, 29 to 32 says, At midnight the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt. For there was not a house where someone was not dead. Then he summoned Moses and Aaron by night and said, Up, go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go serve the Lord as you have said. Take your flocks and your herds as you have said and be gone. And then this last sentence, this last little phrase says it all. And bless me also. Sometimes we have to get to the point of utter brokenness. To the very bottom of it all. Before we will realize the almighty power of God. And seek his grace. Pharaoh sought his grace that night. Unfortunately it wouldn't stick. Because all he wanted was relief from his pain instead of a new life in him. I do not believe that anybody in Egypt that night rejoiced over the death of these firstborn. Honestly, I don't even think the children of Israel were rejoicing at the great loss in the land of Egypt. Even though they were slaves, they lived next to these people. And these were people of God. I don't even think that God rejoiced. And in the midst of the sorrow, God was at work bringing peace and deliverance to those who would trust in him. It'd take many years before the Israelites would live in the promised land again, but they had seen firsthand how God had kept his promise of deliverance, and they had faith that he would continue to bless them through the covenant made so long ago. We too are a part of the covenant with God through the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. If we have faith and trust in him, in our future with him, he will help us through the problems we face in this life. No, he won't take the problems away. Boy, I wish I could just sit up here and tell you today, God, you know, if you'll just trust him, you'll have no more problems. That's what old Smiley in Texas tries to tell them all. Have your best life now. Wow. Wow. I'd like to tell you that, but you'd know I'd be a bold-faced liar, right? Because you're believers in Christ. Has your life been perfect? No. But as the Israelites, we can have faith in the one true God, confident in the knowledge that he always keeps his promises, and he will deliver us from the trials we face in this life. And you know what else? He'll go through them with us. When the Israelites got up and took their flocks and herds and their family and a lot of jewelry and all kinds of other stuff from the plunder of Egypt and they went to head out into that desert on the way to the promised land, do you know that Moses and Aaron were not leading them in the desert? Do you know who was? It was God. 
by a pillar of cloud in the day and a pillar of fire by night. God's presence was always with them, walking with them through those hot sands, walking with them through the valleys and over the mountains, walking with them through the bottom of the Dead Sea on dry land. And he will walk with us. No matter our problems, no matter the difficulties we face, our God is with us. And he is a God who will ultimately bring deliverance in his name. And it's for that reason that we celebrate the Lord's Supper. It's a supper of remembrance that Christ indeed died for us and that one day we will feast at his heavenly banquet. Amen. Let us join together in our communion liturgy. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him and who earnestly repent of their sins and who seek to live in love and peace with their neighbors and who intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God and walking in his holy ways. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another as we pray together saying, Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all people. We acknowledge and weep over our numerous sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed against your divine majesty. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, most merciful Father. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were still sinners, thus proving his love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. And we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you and bless your most holy name, O God our Father. With your word and Holy Spirit, you created all things and called them good. In Jesus Christ, your word became flesh and dwelt among us. Through Jesus' suffering and death, you took upon yourself our sin and death and destroyed their power forever. You raised from the dead this same Jesus, who now reigns with you in glory, and poured upon us your Holy Spirit, making us the people of your new covenant. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus, on the night in which he gave himself up for us, took bread. He broke the bread, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat it in remembrance of me. 
Likewise, after supper, our Lord took the cup. He gave thanks to you, Father, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my blood in the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts, that in the breaking of this bread and the drinking of this cup, we may know the presence of the living Christ and be renewed as the body of Christ for the world, redeemed by his blood, until he comes in final victory, and we feast at your table forever. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence that we are indeed children of God, let us pray the prayer that our Savior taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us partake of the bread which is his body in thanksgiving for the, his brokenness on the cross that we might be healed. And let us partake of the wine which is his blood that was poured out for our forgiveness and be truly thankful. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to close this morning with uh, My Jesus, I Love Thee. My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine, for thee all of sin I resign my gracious redeemer my savior art thou if ever I love thee my Jesus tis now I love thee because thou hast first love in me and purchase my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow. If ever I love my Jesus is now in mansions of glory in endless delight. I'll ever adore thee in heaven so bright. I'll sing with the glittering crown on my brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth to love and serve our God as we reach out to others in his name. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace with joy.